Welcome everyone to this special webinar on the role of faith and communities in helping accelerate the fight to end TB by 2030. We need accurate diagnostics. We need effective drugs for every person with TB. We need standard infection control to ensure zero new TB cases. And we need a lot more to ensure that people get cured of TB. Faith has always played a great key role in helping communities live positively and strongly in adverse situations. Faith leaders as well as our own faith and belief that in the Almighty to overcome obstacles can help a lot in TB care and control too. Let us remember the promises our governments have made by adopting the Sustainable Development Goals at last year's UN General Assembly, one of which is to end TB by 2030. We are really excited to hear what our panelists have to say on the role of faith in the fight against TB. But before that, let me make a few quick announcements. All participants are requested to please send us your questions while the panelists present. No need to wait. Just type your questions in using the chat function or raise your virtual hand which you will see on your screen. We will take up these questions during the question and answer session. I also request all panelists to please present in time so that we have good enough time left for questions and answers. Thanks for your cooperation. Without any further ado, let me welcome today's webinar moderator, Ashok Ramsuru. Ashok is a senior and widely acclaimed award-winning journalist based in Durban, South Africa, having more than 43 years of rich experience in journalism. Over to you, Ashok. It seems Ashok is having some problems with his internet connection. Uh, so I will continue. I will just chip in for him as soon as he is ready. Faith leaders are trusted voices who often live and work in the poorest communities bearing the world's highest burden of TB. Yet they represent a largely untapped network of leaders who due to their unique community status, can help reduce stigma and identify populations of people with TB who need care. The International Union Against TB and Lung Disease has started to develop ways and means to work together with faith leaders, pioneering methods to ensure that people living with TB and HIV can connect to health services that provide diagnosis, treatment, care, and support that they need to survive. Let me introduce today's panel of experts. Jordi Bofa, community-based researcher and epidemiologist at the Desmond Tutu TB Center, Stellenbosch University, Cape Town, South Africa, and Vanier, doctor, doctoral research scholar at the Department of Community Health Sciences, University of Calgary, Canada. Reverend Nicholas Busani Bengu presides over the Uniting Presbyterian Church in the Kalusa community of Peter Maritzburg, South Africa. He is a member of a community research advisory team for a project on the uptake and effectiveness of isoniazid preventive therapy in a region of high TB HIV co infection. Subrat Mohanty Coordinator Project Akshay, International Union Against Tuberculosis and Lung Disease, or more commonly known as the Union. Catherine Mubayakufa, Community Voice on Role of Faith in HIV Care and CNS Correspondent from Zimbabwe. Let me welcome Jordi Bofa, Community-Based Researcher and Epidemiologist at the Desmond Tutu TB Center Stellenbosch University, Cape Town, South Africa. Over to you, Jodi.
Hello, Jody. Can you hear me? Yes, thank you very much for that nice introduction. Um, so, what as a PhD student in KwaZulu Natal, we have a very high burden um, of TB HIV. In uh, more rural communities, I had the pleasure of engaging with community upfront with sort of more grassroots level people to develop the project that I worked on. So for me, I, coming from Canada, I didn't come into it expecting the role of faith to be uh, as pronounced as it was. Um, I had spent enough time in South Africa previously to understand that um, people are, um, I, I suppose, compared to Canada, uh, faith plays a big role in their lives. And going out to communities, um, I work as an ethnographer uh, as well as a community-based researcher. So what that means is I study culture in its current and changing forms. And I suppose I arrived with some degree of bias, expecting that maybe um, more local belief systems would be in play than, um, than sort of a, a, a strong Christian base. Um, and I thought with it being sort of post-apartheid South Africa that there might be a little bit of pushback against the idea of, you know, a, a Christian missionary or something to that effect. Um, but I, I was actually, um, it was, a, it was a really big learning experience for me um, to realize what an important role faith does play in the communities and how um, I was able to work uh, within that realm to actually um, learn a lot for myself on how TB affects communities, but also um, to work with faith communities in terms of uh, just sharing uh, the knowledge from the project that I worked on, um, sharing the differences uh, in uh, the roles of faith within the various sects of, uh, of faith in the communities that I worked in. Um, and we've actually gone on to develop quite um, an exciting project uh, that relates to involving faith leaders in the fight against TB. So I'll start uh, by just briefly explaining to those of you uh, out there um, just kind of an interesting notion that I uh, encountered as um, a foreigner uh, in South Africa when I first talked to people about um, the role of uh, traditional healing and um, local, local forms of healing within the communities. And often when I would bring that topic up, uh, people would say, oh, no, I'm Christian. Um, and they would point to a Bible or start discussing the church that they went to. And for me, that was kind of a shock because I thought, okay, but we're talking about health. We're not talking about your religion. Um, and what does, tr you know, using traditional forms of healing and, and seeking care through herbalists and things like that have to do with religion? And... Um, what I came to understand is, at least in terms of sort of the, the public dialogue or the public presence that people might want to put across, is um, this notion that sort of beliefs in um, ancestor um, wisdom and honoring of ancestors is sort of frowned upon by the outside world, sort of seen as um, backward, um, and not, um, you know, modern. So people see the opposite of that uh, to be Christianity, which is predominantly um, the more common um, denomination uh, in KwaZulu Natal. Interestingly, though, um, there's even though people pit the two things against one another, there there are a lot of ways in which they intermingle, and it's actually quite um, lovely the way that different um, belief systems have sort of come together to mean to, to sort of create almost a hybrid um, 
and, and a way for people to come together. So as Reverend Bengu will tell us, um, he is one of um, the amazing faith leaders that I've worked with who um, has a very strong uh, wish for the health of his community and really wants to do the best that he can for his community. Um, he can tell us a little bit more about some of the different um, uh, more uh, African traditional churches that exist, but how there is the interplay in the everyday between those who even um, identify as being Christian, but also have a profound belief in um, you know what their what their family before them has taught them, and I don't think those two ought to be. Um, distinguished between one another, uh, nor are they incompatible together. Um, so I think uh, what I learned is I really have to push forward um, in working with people to say it's okay to have, um, to work within local models um, and also to consider yourselves Christian. And wouldn't it be great if we can work within both of those models um, to help our communities stay healthy. So um, Reverend Bengu might have a little more to say about the project that we've been developing, but um, uh, through one mechanism or another, what started as a project on a preventive regimen and how communities understood um, as an ISI preventive therapy turned into um, to a bigger um, sort of balloon to bring together uh, faith leaders in whatever form, um, because they do come in in very very a variety of ways um, and sects uh, across KwaZulu Natal, but to bring them together to fight TB, because there's been a tremendous amount of movement in churches across KwaZulu Natal um, to deal with HIV, and I think they've had very effective campaigns. Um, people are uh, in the churches are. Um, it, it's a less stigmatizing disease now. There are a lot of um, churches that uh, invite uh, HIV testing to happen. Um, people have a lot better understanding of some of the ways that HIV is communicated. So we are looking to get TB in the same light because in, in KwaZulu Natal, in some of these communities, nearly 2% of the population um, will develop TB in any given year, which is extremely high compared to the rest of the world. And 70% of those um, cases of TB will be HIV related. So although they're separate, um, they're very much similar within KwaZulu Natal, and yet they've been treated as very separate diseases um, within the, the broader diaspora. So we're starting um, a pilot to actually work with faith leaders from six districts uh, across KwaZulu Natal province. And what we would like to do is um, bring them together in sort of a workshop format to say, how do you see um, TB? and um, sort of normalizing TB, normalizing TB testing, normalizing um, TB symptomology, um, normalizing TB treatment and expressing how difficult it is because it is difficult, especially for people who have trouble accessing um, proper care. Uh, it can be a really, a really, um, a really difficult disease to treat, um, especially when it gets to uh, multi-drug resistant forms, which are also popping up more and more. Um, so how can we tap into um, the, the leadership who is very interested in, in helping their community and work that into um, messaging and, and sort of more creative ways of um, kind of clarifying what, why TB is uh, circulating in the communities, what can be done to help it, and how people can support one another through it, um, rather than sort of vilify or hide or demonize the idea behind it. And we've had a tremendous amount of um, interest from faith leaders. Uh, we actually had to turn a lot of people down for the pilot. Um, 
We're also hoping to work with congregants, um, a, a small number of congregants in each church, to train them up, um, to work with them to learn um, more uh, in-depth concepts and maybe go into the homes of congregants who know someone who might have symptoms but can't necessarily get to church or doesn't necessarily normally attend um, so that they can be there to answer questions but they can also um, do home visits and support people um, and hopefully we're hoping that through this project um, through the pilot we will also be able to start to offer um, through community caregivers that are also congregants or nurses that are also congregants we would be able to offer um, preventive therapy as well as TB treatment within the congregation so we're reaching people who have difficulties getting to clinic either because it's too far away or too costly uh, or because they work during the week and they just can't get there during opening hours so the church also provides um, a place and a space for people to be able to get um, sort of streamlined um, information and um, and also be able to access some of the treatment as long as they're um, not showing any physical signs of um, of issues, but we're hoping that it can become a place where they feel safe to talk about it. And if there are issues that they're encountering on treatment, or if they are showing symptoms that could potentially mean TB, they're able to get tested earlier, get into clinic faster, um, they're getting support for taking pills that aren't necessarily a lot of fun to take, especially when you're, you don't have um, regular food coming into the household um, and a whole lot of side effects can occur um, just to give that support that the church normally gives um, but give it uh, in, in a more uh, sort of specified way, specialized way for the purposes of TV. So maybe I'll leave it there for now um, and if there's anyone who, who would like to know more um, I would be happy to, to talk more about that. Uh, thanks Jodi. Uh, that was Jodi Bofa community-based researcher and epidemiologist at the Desmond Tutu TB Center, Stellenbosch University, Cape Town, South Africa. This is a perfect stage now to invite Reverend Nicholas Busani Bengu, who presides over the Uniting Presbyterian Church in the Kalusa community of Peter Maritzburg, South Africa, and is a member of a community research advisory team for a project on the uptake and effectiveness of isoniazid preventive therapy in a region of high TB HIV co-infection. Welcome Reverend Bengu, over to you now. Thank you so much. Thank you so much and you have introduced me very nicely and um, now I'm not going just to delay you because uh, Jody Bofa has uh, alluded to some of the points that I wanted to, to mention. Uh, all in all, what I'm going to do is to talk about the initiative that uh, she has alluded to. Firstly, I want just uh, to, to thank uh, Jody Bofa because she came here from uh, Canada, as we have heard about the good work she's doing in Guazulu Natal, she found me in the community and made me to be one of her advisory board. As from there, we worked together in the fight against TB. HIV and AIDS till such time where there was a conference, International Union Conference, TV conference in Cape Town. There I wanted just uh, to appreciate and thank the important opportunity the union representatives have given me just to convey my deepest uh, thinking about uh, this uh, presentation today because in 2016 while I was in the conference 
I gave a speech there. After that speech, because Jody made it possible for me, coming from the grassroots community, to attend the conference, and the officials of the union allowed that because the union saw the need to involve as many people as it can so that it fights very well with the with the, the, the much power and with different stakeholders, especially with the people who are touched based with the community down there in the grassroots. I'm one of those people. Since from there, I was appointed to come here in South Africa, in KwaZulu Natal, just uh, to start an initiative in South Africa under the union where the religious communities will work together with the, the government in the fight to end TB, HIV and AIDS, as it has been targeted for 2030. Then, uh, when, uh, since from then, I, I, I didn't sleep. We came in, in Guazul Natal. All we did was to meet with the potential relevant stakeholders in the province, especially in the likes of the provincial health department, the minister Smongseni Lomo, was very excited about the whole initiative and pledged his full support as a department. As he himself regards it uh, as an initiative which will bring the lasting solution not only in the fight against an ending of TB, HIV and AIDS, but in all social ills in the vulnerable communities of the province and the country of South Africa as a whole. Since from there, we never stopped as we were preparing for the World AIDS Conference. As I told you that this initiative uh, started in December last year during the World AIDS, uh, during the uh, International Union Conference in Cape Town. We managed to have built up events, including Faith Leadership Summit, to name the few. All I wanted to highlight here is that uh, this initiative has been marketed and bought very well in my province by different government stakeholders, starting from the head, because even our national minister, Dr. Mzoledi, knows about this initiative. Now, as one who is in the forefront of this initiative, I wanted to make you all who are listening to be aware that for now, with this in, in the faith-based uh, initiative against uh, TB and HIV and AIDS, we are in the point of no return because it gained a lot of momentum. It came on a right time. Now we're busy preparing some or doing some presentations in different stakeholders about this initiative, bringing together religious leadership from all faiths, not only Christians, not only Muslim, not only, but it is across the interfaith spectrum. Why the government, our government, saw this initiative as crucial and important to be supported? 
The reason is that the government has already came forward loud and clear that one, it has formulated many strategies like many governments designs many beautiful and contextual programs and is still busy doing different awareness and trainings dispensing many condoms did a lot of education and create beautiful and sound systems of making treatment to be available quicker and come closer to the patients in order to find and eradicate TB and HIV and AIDS. But the government states that the challenge that it faces, I think this is the international problem. This is the international challenge. That is why I want to change with you that the challenge our government is facing is that the rate a number of defaulting and defaulters on a daily basis is rising, infections still rising immensely. As someone who is working very close with the government, especially the Department of Health, this is the great concern. And the only crucial reason for the religious communities to come as a united force, irrespective of their religious differences, but to use their religious mandate. The reasons why this initiative should be fully supported by the government and why it's very important and why it is a stakeholder that any government in any country cannot do without it. I want to give the reasons just to strengthen my experience. I want to share my experience why the interfaith community should come on board in the fight against me. One, in South Africa, we have a history that from time immemorial, the church has always been at the forefront of the struggle for the liberation of the oppressed, both locally and internationally. I can mention leaders like Reverend Busak, Fred Chikami, Emeritus, Reverend Archbishop Tutu, and many more faith leadership. We also know for sure that some of these faith leaders came forward. Some of them were attacked by the, 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 this TB, and they, they were not afraid to come forward. So that to come as a, as a good example. That is what faith leadership should do, is preparing to do. Therefore, our community still believes in the religious leadership as people who have solutions. Secondly, the church or the religious community or the religious leadership can be found everywhere, even in remote areas that are not easily accessible by the government departments. Because of this fact, the health department has entered in our, in, 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 in our province. It has entered into agreement with religious communities to open the places of worship in order to dispense chronic treatment for its patients. For that reason, mostly of our communities take religious or faith leadership as a representative of God and therefore has the final authority. Therefore, this puts it in a better position and it has credibility to reach out to those infected and affected by HIV and AIDS and TB alike. 
And I want to assure the listeners and all of you who are listening today that within a few years, our initiatives in South Africa under the International Union is going to yield best fruits because now the government has acknowledged that the church, the interfaith community, has a very crucial role to play. I think that is the route that all the governments in the world should follow. Our minister, Dr. Mutsoledi, is so happy. He brings on board all the interfaith to come and fight alongside with the government. Therefore, the church in South Africa, the faith communities, through this initiative, will be channeled because now we will be making a one force. Because initially, each and every church were doing its own thing. But now, this initiative will bring us together for one common goal. The church in South Africa has earned the right to be heard through its involvement in, in human rights and human affairs. Community members pass through the church doors even before they are attended to by either doctors or traditional healers. The church counsels the victims of the above on a regular basis. For, for, for instance, I'm a chaplain in the Department of Health. The Department of Health in Wazulu Natal did a very wise and wonderful thing. He hired 37 interfaith leadership from different religions to come and give counseling in the, in the department to work with the department facilities that on its own was a breakthrough because we saw the work that has been done by the church. Chaplains did a wonderful job up to now. The church has sufficient human resource in the form of volunteers. Here, in our churches, we have trained many volunteers that are busy doing the job, giving counseling, testing. If the church is doing it, remember that people believe and trust the church. The church's ministry takes place right in the community. It also speaks the language of the people and is familiar with the different cultural practices, as Jody was saying. The church has the statistics of most families. We are keeping the records. Each and every religious community has got a record of its members. That is a good a background of this initiative. The church is familiar. The church is familiar with the people's daily life struggles. I can go on and on and on. As I said earlier, the government and our faith communities are waiting for our way forward to put you on the picture. We have already tried to put ourselves some few strategies provided the union gives us a go ahead. These were mostly based on 27 preparations. For example, we have built up events prior 27 March 2017 World TB Day event, a well-organized World TB Day event, which was going to be a yearly observed provincial event, which in turn was going to be a huge yearly observed national event. As a religious communities, we were going to mass massify build up events. We are preparing to do 
awareness campaigns, education, TB, within and outside the place of worship, bringing events, workshops, and trainings for civil and clergy religious leadership will be together to appoint religious TB ambassadors within each religious communities to formulate messages, sermons, and relevant messaging and well packaging of TB and HIV and AIDS within the context of faith perspective in order to avoid confrontation, but to be complementary towards what the church is already been doing to help our community because the churches are, are, are working. If succeeded, hopefully, we are going to make this a national campaign with the aim of popularizing the understanding of TB and HIV and AIDS in South Africa. Here, we will train and skill clergy faith leadership in the district across their faith spectrum. We massify prevention in the place of worship. We allocate TB, HIV, and AIDS Sundays before and after 27 March World TB Day. Each district will begin to celebrate TB Day, but as you, you, as you know, our challenge will be a financial capital, but hopefully, God is great. I think this initiative is going far. That is all what I can share with you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Reverend Nicholas Bhutani Bengu. Thanks for sharing all the excellent work you and your uh, companions are doing, and all falls to you in this fight against TB. Moving thank on. Thank you so much. Moving on, let us listen to Subrat Mohanty, coordinator of the project Akshay of International Union Against Tuberculosis and Lung Disease, who has been instrumental in the fight against TB in India, a country with the world's highest TB burden. Over to you, Subrat. Thanks, Subha. <coughs> and uh, thank you, Judy and uh, Rivendar Basari for your excellent uh, remarks and insight into the subject. And uh, uh, my name is Subrat and I work with the union in India. And uh, at the union in India, we are implementing a huge civil society initiative across uh, 285 districts and 19 states, reaching to vulnerable and marginalized population uh, in the country for TB care and control. India, India is a unique country which uh, encompasses uh, several religions and also religious groups. Religion, of course, plays a very important role uh, in the people, in the community and each sphere of life in India. I will be talking about uh, an initiative. Uh, can you move to the slide? Yeah, I'll be talking about an initiative uh, which has been uh, taken up to Project Akshay. Uh, just to tell uh, everyone that Akshay is, uh, is the, the name is basically an acronym given to the project and uh, which means no TV. And uh, this has been implemented uh, to the union under the development grants. Can you go to the next slide? Yeah, and uh, Project Aksha is covered, as I said, 285 districts and 40 urban sites. And we are working with
So we this... cannot hear you, so Brad. Yes, I think you were off uh, the web. Yes, now we can hear you, Brad, again. Uh, yes, we can hear you now. Okay. But, so, no, I, yes, I, yes. can you hear me now? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. So, I, I was talking about why religious institutions are so important because they have very strong and wider networks. They are respected and accepted by the religious community. When they appeal, it reaches far and corner. And in India, we have the example of one of the interventions, uh, which is known as polio elimination campaign in India, where the religious community, the religious group, has actually shown that with the involvement, we can show to everyone that the polio can be eliminated. And it has the influence on community behavior and practices, which can be leverages for improving public health. Uh, this I actually I wanted to, to show to everyone because this has come from our Prime Minister, Mr. Narendra Modi ji. He spoke it uh, before on the last year World TV Day that why TV is so important and, and we all are united to, to defeat TV in India. So I, I'm now going through the my main, main intervention about how we have actually implemented an intervention in a Muslim uh, community involving the, the Muslim religious leaders. Uh, the project, Project Aksha has actually, I'm talking about uh, a state called Bihar, where uh, we have 38 districts. And out of 38 districts, more than 12, 15 districts are having uh, 20 percent or more than 20 percent of Muslim population. So we wanted to, to do some interventions in those districts where we have the large section of Muslim population. And uh, we feel that how we can reach to those Muslim population. And that's the best way to, to, to enter is Madrasa. Madrasa are the, are the Muslim, uh, uh, Muslim educational institutions where the students come and they've been taught about several things, including including the, the education. So we wanted to bring those students together and tell them about the tuberculosis the in terms of TB, and so that they understand TB and when they go back to their community, because that community is, they remain very secluded, they remain together. And they can go back and talk about TB in the family, in the community, so that they can identify symptomatics. So the basic objective was to, to, uh, to involve the madrasa, the educational institution, khanka, the religious bodies, and the mosque existing in the state for spreading the, the message about tuberculosis, the availability of the services under the revised national TV control program in the state. So, so what, what actually, can I move to the next slide? So, so the, the process actually started when we, we had the initial discussion with the various leaders, various religious leaders of the Muslim community and Muslim institutions. We started discussion with uh, the Imrat Sariya Molana, uh, who is the general secretary, who has the influence of not only in the state of Bihar, but in other states, the chairman of Bihar State, Siha Wak Board, uh, the chairman of Sunni Wak Board, Chairman of Bihar State Madrasa Education Board and, uh, and, and the ex-chairman of Bihar State 15 point program. So, so they, they, uh, they were the, the key influencer in the Muslim community uh, in, uh, across the across various institutions. And what they said actually, they said that there are 7,000 madrasa existing in the state. Madrasa are the, again, the educational institutions of the Muslim. And, Madrasa are managed by the Madrasa Education Board, Madrasa are managed by Imrat Sariya, and also Idari Sariya. And there are some Madrasa also managed privately. So what they suggested that, why not a apple from all the religious body heads goes out? And uh, the, the, the next slide will show you a, a sample of the apples from various heads of the Muslim institutions in, in Urdu, in Hindi, and also in their language. So, so what again, I, I'm going to talk about the implementation of the same activity. 
So a state level workshop was organized among the Muslim religious leaders in, the, in December 2015 and to decide a framework on how we can intervene the madrasa uh, program in the state of Bihar. So a state level work conference organized by the Central Work Board Government of India on March 2016 followed the meeting of December 2015 attended by the President and Secretary of all the districts of committee of 38 districts of Bihar. Another state level workshop on Madrasa intervention was organized on 22nd July of 2016 where the Honorable Minister also participated and besides the several other influential leaders. And in various Madrasa institutions, they were also invited to attend the meeting because it was not such a meeting but also to sensitize the Madrasa about the TV intervention. Yeah, can you go to the next slide please? So this is the first level, uh, this is the photograph of few uh, events, this is the first level state level concerns of WhatsApp. Can you go to the next one please? It is the second uh, state level consultation work, so you can see the one of the very senior uh, leader from the Muslim uh, religious group is talking about about the role of the, the Muslim institutions in TV. Can you go to this one, please? So you can see the, the madrasa in terms of how it's happening. So many students across the madrasa, they gathered where we are sensitizing about a, a TV and giving them a knowledge about about TV, the services available in, in the in the community. Can go to next slide, please. And this is very important because this photograph says that when a, the advocacy appeal was distributed in the state level work conference uh, in in March 2016. Yeah, can go to next slide, please. This is something a appeal released by the Najin Imrat Sarya in Hindi. That's a very important uh, religious group who actually appeal to all the community to join together for TV services. Uh, can you go next? Yeah. So how this program is supported by the by the state revised national TV control program or state TV program in, in the state. The state TV officer in the state, we have a state TV officer who has actually personally visited many madrasa of the state and participated in the awareness program in madrasa. So that's a very encouraging step from the from the state uh, TV officer. The people residing near to Madrasa are invited by the chief of Madrasa to know more about TV and availability of services under revised national TV control program. A quarterly reporting format has been developed by the RNTCP, the TV program, to actually capture the We can't hear you, Subrat. Yeah. Yes, now we can hear you, yes. Okay. Can you move to the next slide, please? Yeah. So some of the outcomes of this madrasa interventions were the leader, the key leaders, key influence leader in the madrasa, they actually endorsed the TV program in several ways by passing information about TV in the Friday pairs. This is no, it's a very important prayer for the Muslim population. So providing educational materials to members of the community and conducting information session at mosque. So that's one of the outcome uh, of our intervention. Madrasa intervention, although was started in nine districts, now expanded to 15 districts. The state has now planned to, to endorse all the districts uh, in the Bihar. Nearly 17,000 students have been sensitized so the best thing is that out of the sensitization program, 23 symptomatics have been identified and referred to the nearest microscopy center for sputum examination. And uh, this intervention has actually scaled up now. And from Bihar, we have 
now scaled up to the state of Uttar Pradesh, which is one of the, one of the biggest state in the country, where we also have a, uh, a significant Muslim population and would like to try out the same intervention in, in the UP uh, across nine states, nine districts. <coughs> can, you, can you go to the next slide, please? So one of the quote from a, uh, from a participant who joined the, the program, he said that I had very little knowledge of TV before attending this session, Ajay Aspar. And he said that TV orientation session at the Madrasa provided information on TV, symptoms, diagnostic and treatment. And most importantly, he learned that free treatment services are available at government health center throughout his region, which is very encouraging one. So what next? We plan something, we plan something, we interview. Uh, the next step is that we are going to train a group of trainers from the madrasa in March. We are identifying and training the volunteers from the same community so that they reach out the Muslim community to intensify case finding and uh, they will be delivering the messages also for purposes. We'll collect the student and transport it from the from the Muslim community to the nearest technical educational migration center. The community volunteer from the community will be acting as a duty provider. They'll be trained by the program. And through the religious institution, we also asked and to support the TV patient for nutritional support and other social support, vocational training, and other income generation programs. And uh, at the same time, we are also making an effort to engage other religious institutions, Joshua's institution, Gurdwara, the, uh, uh, and the, all the Hindu religious bodies for sciences. So thank you so much uh, for this opportunity, Sova, and we all can make a difference. We, we all can unite together. Thank you so much. Amen to what you have said, Sobrat, and thanks very much for your excellent presentation. And now last but not the least, in fact, we have saved the best for the last, the voice from the front lines, Catherine Mabayukufa, will share her personal experience on the role of faith for people living with HIV. She is also an acclaimed CNS correspondent from Zimbabwe. Over to you, Catherine. Good morning. My name is Catherine Yakufa, a fellow of CNS Health. I'm an award-winning journalist and communicator from Zimbabwe. I'm also a correspondent for the Manika Post, which is a weekly newspaper in Zimbabwe. I, I'm sorry, we are currently having Cyclone Dion, and there are lots of rains that are pouring. Our, our area has been cut off, and I'm, I failed to travel to, into the city where there is connection. So I'll read out what I was supposed to give you as my brief. The HIV and TB response hinges on faith and consistent and proper intake of medication. Acceptance of any condition is the first step to recovering. Denial is fatal. Acceptance is a process and not an event. So the road to getting well begins by accepting any condition that one has. Not everyone has to disclose their condition publicly. One can disclose to a loved one who will have help them remind them when it is time to take medication. But for me, as a journalist, I found out that disclosing my status would help because people would read my articles and know that she is also walking the same path on the HIV medication adherence and getting well. For me, my husband is my medic buddy. He reminds me time to take my pills is now. I take medication for diabetes mellitus, hypertension, and my ARVs. My husband is my adherence partner. He only takes pills for hypertension. I personally realized the power of faith is a discordant couple. Anything I do is encompassed by perseverance, determination to overcome odds, and to live a healthy life. The first battle is having faith to overcome. I have minor children who will graduate from college in my presence. That is faith. I have faith and I follow doctor's instructions. I do not have blind faith, blind faith in anyone. 
My creator is my maker and is my rock. Faith and religious leaders have a great role to play in handling diseases like TB and HIV. The saying that religion is the opium of the people is true. In Zimbabwe, traditional leaders are respected in their communities and empowering them with treatment literacy pays off. Their word is listened to. Empowering leaders with treatment literacy is a starting point to fighting stigma. In my country, Zimbabwe, most of the faith leaders and traditional leaders support the intake of medication. However, there are a few greedy new faith leaders who greed out to make money. They claim to have powers to anoint one. They sell anointed bracelets, pens. If one needs to pass an exam, they sell you the anointed pen. How is that possible without one having started? They sell, they sell DVDs, anything they can think of, and even making money out of desperate patients who think they can be healed by anointed bracelets. They claim that by your faith you are healed. We then have patients defaulting on medication, believing they are healed. This is sad and dangerous. Dr. Tapua Nashe Pukakura, giving feedback in Harare after the Melbourne AIDS conference, said most of those who left treatment in between were those wearing the anointed bangles on their wrists. The, people, the patients testified that they had stopped medication after receiving their so-called healing. This ought not to be found in today's response, as such faith leaders are misinforming their, misinforming their followers when they are out to make some money. There are, however, many well-meaning faith leaders who encourage followers to take medication as the doctor's instructions. For example, we have Inarela Zimbabwe, under reference to Ponda, it encourages affected communities to seek medical help and have faith that their medication will will work. South African based Secretary General of Inarela, Reverend Pumusile Mapizela, raises the faith bar by saying, pray, pray, pray that your medication will work and never default on treatment. She fights stigma and discrimination saying, run away from any faith leader who says by your faith you are healed. He or she is taking their medication privately, encouraging you to stop, run away with your dear life. Rather, pray that you remain faithful to taking medication. Back to traditional leaders. In Zimbabwe, traditional leaders, most of them, most of them encourage the use of medication that is prescribed by the doctors. The local chapter in Zimbabwe of traditional medicine called Sinata dismisses the notion that ages patients to stop taking medication. Working together with the National AIDS Council, they have been trained and workshops have been held to empower them. So I believe faith has a pivotal role that it plays in one getting on the road to recovery, but blind faith in a person does not work. Thank you. I'm sorry that I have not been able to join you. Today. Thanks, Catherine, and all power to Thank you. you. Good time to open the floor for question and answers now. Participants, please keep sending your questions using the chat function or raise your virtual hand on the webinar screen. We now begin the question and answer session. Uh, we have a senior TB rights advocate, David Bryden. Uh, David, would you like to ask your question yourself? Uh, David, can you hear me? David has a question for Jody. Yes, David, will you ask or should I ask on your behalf? Okay, okay I am asking this question uh, on behalf of David Bryden. Uh, he says, religious communities in donor countries like Canada and the U.S are aware of the urgency of HIV and malaria, but not tuberculosis. We need their solidarity and support. What can we do to inform and involve them? Jodi, would you like to answer? Sure, thank you very much. Um, that is a great question. Um, 
Uh, I believe uh, the person who's asking the question is from Results, which is um, yes. a great way to start. Um, yes. I, I do think um, we need to we need to have more people um, like Nicholas, uh, like Catherine, who are you know powerful speakers who can talk um, from the community experience. Um, and I think we also, as um, public health specialists, need to get the word out in a more um, just adapt to to a more friendly format. You know, a media. Uh, friendly format and a social media friendly format because it's as it stands it's not happening. So um, I do uh, invite uh, David to also, um, if he is listening, if he has any ideas, um, we welcome them for sure. Uh, okay. Uh, does anybody else want to add to that? Any of the panelists, would you like to add something? Uh, okay, we, we have a comment from Dinesh Kumar. Uh, he, uh, he says, involving faith-based organizations and leaders of such organizations is a wise decision, and the slides shown by Subrat are encouraging, inspirational, and appreciating. So, thumbs up to Subrat and all our other panelists as well. Uh, we have another question from Dr. Nimar Ortuno from Damien Foundation, Brussels. Uh, again to Jodi, what are the main constraints to have the religious leaders involved? And maybe Reverend Bengu can also answer this. Well, one of the things um, I was hoping Nicholas would bring up is um, is the fact that they've got some wonderful things going on. I don't think there are huge constraints. I think people are very interested. Um, I think on the side of the TB program people and the policymakers, we make a huge mistake by overcomplicating um, what is in fact needed in the communities. Um, I think. You know, I've seen some of the work that we've done in the lead up to to our pilot, and for example, a lot of the information that's going out is is going out in a very lecture didactic format um, to communities and in the English language, which makes absolutely no sense, considering that when we're talking about grassroots people, we're talking about people who are uh, the lived experience of. Um, their communities, and often they do things in their own languages. They have, um, you know, very uh, they're very knowledgeable in in the sense of what the community knows and believes. And it takes um, it takes time to get get to that, to get past the just you know the friendly speak, the the talk about oh I'm not I, I don't believe in ancestors that kind of thing, um, because people will, uh, especially you know in the Kwazulu Natal context, they're they're very accommodating and they will say what they think you want to hear. And um, so we have um, one of the things that Nicholas has gone ahead and done is he has a WhatsApp group of of hundreds of interested faith leaders, um, and he just keeps them there to to, to talk about things um, because. W it, you know, bureaucracy sort of gets in the way. We have a whole bunch of leaders that are saying, why haven't we done this yesterday? And we're still garnering support for it um, to be able to, to carry it out, uh, to carry a full pilot out. So really, they're willing, they're there, they're able. Um, we just need to make sure that um, we're engaging with the people and not uh, assuming that we have all the answers coming from a sort of programmatic perspective. Uh, thank you. Uh, there is a question from a journalist from Philippines for Reverend Nicholas. Uh, she wants to know that from your experience, uh, Reverend, does faith impact men and women differently in the fight against TB? Come again, can you rephrase your question? Uh, does faith impact men and women differently? Does it affect them differently? Uh, in this fight against TB or when you are talking to them, uh, is there any difference, is there any gender dimension to it? 
Oh, I get you. Yes, yes. It affects them differently because of gender-based. As you would know that uh, there are these cultural beliefs. You see, to make an example, men are not quick to go for testing. They wait for their wives, for their girlfriends to test. For instance, in, in HIV and AIDS, I will wait for my wife to go. If my wife is negative, I will take as if I'm also negative. Because uh, culturally, you know, there is that ego to men. Secondly, there is this thing of uh, having many uh, girlfriends, whereas a wife is expected to, 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 to have one husband. You know, there is that cultural belief which causes, you know, the infection to be so high because if I come back, I sleep with uh, many women. Do you uh, uh, think what will happen? And I come back home as a man. My wife is not expected to question. If I say I don't use a condom, who will question me because uh, I'm a man? There are so many things that uh, we need to teach and educate our people. Yes, but I think we are going there. As a faith uh, leadership, we have identified those gaps to be filled. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Nicholas, um, this is Jody. I just wanted to follow up on that on that comment um, okay. because I know you and I have talked about it, and we said that the um, churches might be a way to reach more of the men. And I asked yes. you, well, in your congregation, who is more likely to attend church? Uh, and in that sense, it's it's similar to the clinic, clinics, right? Um, women are are more um, more in attendance. So in that sense, what would you as a faith leader do, say, to, to involve men, especially as concerns um, TB? Yes, Judy, even in church, women are many, men are few. We, in the church, we have started many projects, many campaigns, we work together, as uh, I've said earlier, that uh, we were fortunate that the, the government, uh, in fact, our history has taught us that uh, the church, even long, long ago, was in the forefront in the fight against apartheid. Now, because of that, the government uh, it is not leaving the church away. Because of that, there are those churches who have beautiful initiatives just uh, to teach. For instance, in my church, I have an initiative, I have a program which is called We Love Them. That program is dealing with, you know, awareness, education, with all of these uh, 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 critical, uh, you know, crucial uh, 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 topics about men being so supportive, coming forward to test for all the, you know, the illnesses, all the diseases. Yes, in the church, in my church, because of that uh, teaching, because I'm there. I'm seeing a lot of changes, which means that uh, we religious leaders have got a lot of impact in changing, you know, the, the thinking of our society. 
Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We, okay. we, we have a question from Aarti Bhar, a very senior journalist, journalist from India. Uh, this is a question for Subrat. Uh, Aarti wants to know how much impact has Man Ki Baat had on the issue of TB in India? Has it given it a has it given a push to the program? Uh, Subrat, can you hear me? Yeah, I mean, I, I, and uh, see, it's a TV program. Uh, also requires strong political commitment. And a person like Prime Minister Mr. Modi talking about TV, it has its own game because immediately this information was passed through across the country, across the program that. Our Prime Minister is talking about TV and he actually wants TV to be defeated. That is very significant. The way we can move forward with the with the, the financing of TV program, the government pride program, it, it all counts uh, when Prime Minister talks about that. It's a not a question of uh, the outcome because outcome in any way we have the program, we have the program very Sound program uh, are in PCP and uh, we are measuring the program. But I think I think this is very very important for a political commitment at the highest level. Okay, thank you. One more question for Subrat uh, from a participant from Nepal. Uh, he wants to know that uh, does Akshay project have uh, uh, some? Uh, uh, do they envisage involving other religious communities as well? Right now, you had uh, talked about the Muslim religious uh, uh, Muslim uh, religious heads, how they are involved in Akshay project. Uh, are you going to involve heads of churches and temples also in India in future? Thank you for the question, uh, I, I, I think probably I could not make it very, um, you know, missing <laughs> my earlier presentation. I said that this this project, this Akshay project. We have already have three partners who are supporting this program are from the from the Christian organization. They are from Catholic Business Conference of India, Catholic Health Association of India, and Emmanuel Health Association. So they are already involved in this program. Secondly, in the my last slide, I said that as a, as a next step, we are also going to involve more of the church-based organizations, Gurdwara. Uh, and other Hindu religious bodies for the, for the TV program. And that is what we have already in the plan. Okay, thank you. Uh, there is a very good comment from Dr. Papu Sarma uh, giving a new dimension to faith. Uh, he says patients need to have faith in their doctor and health system too. Otherwise, we cannot motivate them. And proper counseling adds to the faith of patients in doctors. Does anyone want to comment? Any of the panelists want to comment on that? I so think that's a very good comment. Yes. Yes. It is. Yes. Uh, the, um, then we have. Yes. If you don't mind, yes. a quick comment there. Yes. Um, thank you. Um, I do. I. I also um, think that's a very important part of the process, um, and I think the way to get there. Is is also um, within the biomedical model, which is often used um, within clinics in the communities that we work in. Um, there has to also be an understanding of the local um, healing models and face models of the community, um, because if it's if strictly coming for a sermon, let's say, um, it often, you know. Um, what I found in my research is that people will will take the information, um, they will give that that um, very agreeable uh, affirmation that they've heard and they understand. When often um, they're afraid of you know talking about how that might interact uh, with their beliefs or um, if there's something that's troubling them, uh, they're afraid to be 
you know, considered a defaulter or considered uh, unruly or something like that. And so they would rather just um, kind of give that nod and smile. Um, whereas if I think if there were more interaction between um, or more understanding for the local belief systems um, and a discussion around that, I mean, I know um, clinicians are limited in the amount of time they have for any given encounter, especially in these high burden settings. But just having that local knowledge and being able to um, to work within it and ask questions that elicit more than yes or no answers um, to better understand where they're coming from within that context, because people, of course, will vary um, in their degrees of faith in kind of both models. Very well said, Jogi. Very well said. Uh, uh, also, uh, uh, there is somebody, uh, Dr. Nimer Ortuno from uh, Damien Foundation, Brussels, makes a very pertinent point. He says, I have worked in Guinea, and during fasting for religious purposes, people on treatment refuse to take anti-TB medicines in the morning. How does one cope with this, these kind of problems? This is a question for any of the panelists to answer. If they have come across such a problem, it is a, it's a very pertinent uh, problem. I'm going to speak up again here, and please, anyone else, jump in if they have um, if they have something to, to contribute, because I don't want to hog the stage. Um, but we have, you know, we found similar, um, you know, similar practices in in the communities that we work in. Um, not necessarily fasting, but uh, people who will vomit on a regular basis as a form of cleansing, and so making sure that rather than telling people not to do something or to do um, something that maybe doesn't fit within their beliefs, I think it's imperative that the clinicians also work within the context to figure out when can they take it and how can the regimen accommodate some of um, those practices and um, also giving information on here is how you might be impacted if you were to take it in the morning, here's how you might be impacted uh, if you don't. Um, and now it's up to you to decide how, how you want to do that, because ultimately it, it is, um, it's an informed decision that both the clinician and the patient have to make together. Thank you. Uh, Lokadia from Zimbabwe uh, wants to ask a question. Lokadia, are you there, if you would like to ask? I can see the hand raised. Oh. Okay, I think we will now come to the end of our webinar. We have already overshot the time by almost uh, 20 minutes. Uh, thanks to all our esteemed panelists and all the participants for being with us today on this very special and important webinar. As always, the recording of the webinar will be made available soon to all of you. Have a good day and bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.